This is the Haven Smokeless Fire Pit from Bright Fire, and it's not a wood stove. Okay, more accurately, it's not just a wood stove. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this pinnacle of stove design, keep watching. Just before we get started, I want to thank Chris at Bright Fire for sending me the Haven so that I could share it with you. Now, you know, I've had this stove much longer than I should have before making the review video. I wanted to take some time to get a good understanding of how this stove operates at its best. So having done that, now I want to do is take you down to the tabletop. We're going to assemble the stove. I'll show you how it all goes together. We'll talk about its key features and its physical specifications. We're going to get it outside and we're going to do some demonstrations with it. All right, I've taken the stove apart so I can show you how it goes together. But before I do, there's just a few things I want to mention. So to start with, let's be clear, this is not a backpacking stove. It is way too heavy for that. This comes in at 8 pounds, 6 ounces, or 3.79 kilograms. It may be too heavy for backpacking, but you could certainly take this car camping on an ATV, on a snowmobile, in a canoe or a kayak, in the back of a pulk. I can see a number of ways of carrying this just not on your back. Now the next thing I want to say is that I have collapsed it down into what I consider its most compact state. What I have found from experience is there may not be any one right, right way or correct way of putting this all together like this, but I'll show you the way I have done it here. And the third thing is just because I know someone's going to say that that this is a puzzle stove, it is way too complex. It yes, it is a bit of a puzzle stove. I won't deny that at all. There is a bit of a technique for putting it together. It does get easier with experience, but let's just be clear, it does take a bit of experience to get to that point. However, once it goes together, you'll understand the reason why there are so many components for it. So let's get started. So the top pieces that I have are the combustion chamber pieces themselves. I'll take those off. I want to move the rest of the uh, uh, stove aside. So for what we have here are the two end pieces. You can tell they are the combustion chamber pieces by the fact that they're dirty and the front piece and the back piece. So I'm just laying these out like this because I'll be putting it together in a moment. And the next pieces I want to show you I have stacked inside are the fire grate and ash pan. So they're going to go in like this. Now the rest of the components aren't necessary for the function of the stove. What they do is they add to the versatility of the stove. So let's start with the ash pan. So the ash pan is going to slide into a bottom set of slots right down here. And you'll know you'll have the, in well, after it gets dirty, of course, you're going to know which way is inwards. But to begin, the lip should be facing, it needs to be facing inwards. So let's slide that into place. Maybe I can give you a close up of how those lock into place here. Slide them in and just slide them forward a little bit. And same thing with the fire grate in the set of slots right above it. Now, I will admit, for me, this is the most challenging part of putting this stove together. And that is taking the front plate and putting it on to those two, the ash pan and the fire grate. Let me just move those aside, make a little bit more room. If you can get this part done, or for me, if I can get, when I get this part done, then it's really no part, no trouble at all putting the rest of the stove together. The problem is trying to line up both the ash pan and the fire grate at the same time and moving them through the slots. It takes a bit of experience. I've done this often enough, but I still struggle a little bit with this when I'm first setting the stove together, as you can see I am. All right, let's back in again. Lining them up. And of course, what's not helping matters today is the fact that I'm doing it in reverse of what I would normally be doing this. All right, I think we're almost, all right, okay, that wasn't so hard, was it? All right, like I said, once you get that together, then it's everything else falls into place, as you'll see. So now that I have the front piece, the back piece, the ash pan, and the fire grate all installed, now I just have to drop the two side plates on. Now, the side plates have a bit of a design feature you have to be aware of. It has a long protrusion on one end of it as opposed to the other end, and the lip faces inward. Once you understand that, the long protrusion is going to go to the back, and it's going to slide into the slots closest to the center here and it draws, drop right into place, just like that. Same thing for the other plate, a little longer on one side, 
and it drops into place. Now the stove is fully functional. You could use it just the way it is. Now it won't be at its most efficient and you're not really saving a whole lot of weight as you'll see in a moment. But before I go into the next step, I just want to point a few features. If you'll notice, there are holes along the top and that's true on the sides and the back all up here. And those are secondary jets because this is a wood gas stove and that's just the intended function. That's what makes it a smokeless fire pit is the fact that it will burn wood gases like any other wood gas stove. This one to an extreme inefficiency as you will see. In order for that to take place though, you do need an inner and an outer wall. The combustion chamber is obviously the inner wall. The outer wall are the plates I'm about to put on. So these plates are made from anodized aluminum hard anodized aluminum. There's the back plate. Let me install that. Drops into place. Front plate, install that. Drops into place. The two end pieces are identical, so it really doesn't matter which end you're going to drop them into. All right, now the stove is fully functional and at its most efficient when you're as, for, as far as putting it together goes. You can use this without any of the other components I'm about to show you. What will happen now is as you light the fuel inside of the stove, air will be drawn in underneath the sides into the bottom of the fire chamber through the fire grate and it will feed air up through. At the same time, air will move up the walls all the way around the stove and reintroduce warmed air in through those jets at the top, which will mix with the wood gases that are being released from the wood as it burns and reignite. And that's what gives you the efficiency of a wood gas stove. Here's something I just want to point out before we move on is look at this thing. Look how wide it is and low it is. And with the feet that protrude out of the sides, this is an exceptionally stable stove. It really, really is. There's no chance of accidentally tipping this over. You would have to really try to get this thing to fall over. It's certainly not going to fall over from having a pot on top or a pan or from the wind or any other reason. The other thing I want to point out right now is the fact that when this is assembled and in operation, it is extremely cool as far as heat being transferred down through the bottom. And that is because of the design of it. It's drawing all the heat upwards through the sides as well as in through the stove. So very little of the heat from the combustion is actually moving down into the surface underneath. Now that doesn't mean that you shouldn't necessarily put some on under this on top of what, whatever you're cooking on the picnic table or whatever. But I have seen Chris demonstrate this on his glass patio table as well as picnic tables and without any concern for combustion of the materials underneath. Just the same, I usually like to put something underneath like a little bit of a fiberglass mat or something else underneath there. So yeah, we'll demonstrate that when we get to that point. The third thing is because of this design, this is extremely resistant to the wind. And what I mean by that is, it, you know, in strong winds you don't get a real serious effect on the combustion inside. So those are all good features in its favorite. Now let's go on to the next couple of things that you would be using on the stove. So the key component to adding the following components is this back plate. Let me bring it up front so you can see it a little bit better. And as you can see one side has gotten considerably dirty than the other side and there's a reason for that. Obviously this is the side I face into the fire when I'm cooking. This side can be used as a reflector if you want to take in more of the ambience and maybe reflect a little heat forward. But let me show you how it's installed. So you'll notice at the bottom there are slots on either side. And at the back of the stove where we put the last of the anodized aluminum pieces, there's room to slide this into place. And that's it. That's all you have to do to make this fully functional. It looks as if I'm going to have to pull the camera back a little bit to show you how the next components go on. But before I do that, let me just show you those next components. So, the two pieces that are used most often for cooking with the stove is this grill, and this grill will go right on top here, like that, and it can also be used in conjunction with the back plate, which I'll show you in a moment. The next component is this plate right here, which is both a fire plate, or excuse me, a fry pan when it's placed inside like this. Now I have four sides to it. Or it can be used as a cover to cover things over and make like a bit of an oven on top of this plate as well. And the next component is this, which is a pot stand. And in order to assemble the pot stand, let's move the stove back a tiny bit. You can see the design of it. Three crossbars. Let's put the crossbars on. 
slide them into place. All right, so the crossbars are now locked into place. Now with the crossbars locked into place, you can use this fire grip or this pot stand either right down here at the bottom or again with the back plate. Now what I do need to do is just move the camera back a little bit so you can see the back plate in operation. All right, so again, we'll slide the back plate into place on the back. Now with the back plate in, you can also use each of these components by locking them in with locking lo or locking slots right here on two places, here and at the top. So like that, or like that. And that's true for the pot stand as well. And of course the fry pan or this plate works best in conjunction with the grill, but it can work separately. It doesn't lock into the back plate without using the grill, but that's okay. Now, why do you need so many locking pieces or locking or locations for this to operate? So functionally, here's what you might do. If you get a fire started in this, or when you get a fire started in this, obviously it's at its most intense shortly after it starts combusting. So at that point, you can have a lot of flame. Normally, when you're cooking with a wood stove or an open fire, you have to wait wait until the fire starts to die down so that you have a lot more controlled heat and not so much intense flame. You normally want to cook, unless you're boiling water of course, you normally want to cook over hot coals, not intense flame. Well that's quite a bit of time and fuel being consumed while you're waiting for that to occur. So here is where the genius of this design comes in. So with the back plate installed, I can start cooking the moment I light the fire by taking the, this plate and bringing it all the way up to the top, all that distance away from the flame. So I can start cooking right away. I've moved away from the intense heat of the flame, but I still have access to the heat that's rising below this. So I can either use the grill, the grill with the pan, and again flip it over and turn it into a bit of an oven. Now, as the fire progresses and the fuel starts to burn down and the flame starts to reduce, I can then lift it off of the top, bring it down to the next slot and slide it into place. So I'm a little bit closer, again, to the major portion of the heat and I'm able to control the amount of heat that I have at that point. And finally, when the fire dies down even further, I can remove the back plate bring this back into play and you'll notice that there are little notches on either side. They made up with two little tabs right here to lock it in so it doesn't slide or move on you. And now I have my grill as close to the coals as I can. So I get maximum amount of heat and I have the, uh, I have the control starting at the top, the middle and the bottom so that I can regulate my heat and begin cooking right away. So I think that's quite ingenious. All right, we're gonna take a moment to go through the physical specifications for the Haven uh, smokeless fire pit, but uh, all the information I'm about to give you, I will put in the video description below, obviously. So let's just start with some of the obvious, the weight. As I mentioned, it comes in eight pounds, six ounces, which is 3.79 kilograms. Now you can take a little bit of weight off of this by leaving some of the other components at home. But to be honest, they're all intended to work together as a system and you'd be missing out if you don't take all those components. So let's look at the height of this. So at its height right here, it comes in at five inches and five eighths, five and five eighths inches, which is 14.3 centimeters. If I add the back wall, it comes in in the 11 inches and 11 and three eighths inches, which is 29 centimeters. The width in this direction is nine and one eighth inches, 23.1 centimeters. And from front to back, it measures in at six and three eighths inches or 16.2 centimeters. The burn chamber inside is four inches in this direction, four inches in this direction, and six inch or six inches in this direction, four in that direction, and four inches deep. Okay, now let's just talk about the materials for this stove because this is part of what makes this stove uh, special. So Chris worked hard to find a source of stainless steel that would meet the design specifications and he did so, but first off, it's not easy to get and it's not cheap to purchase, but it is the right steel for this stove. This is not your typical 304 stainless steel that's used in so many other stoves. This is a high grade, 
highly heat resistant stainless steel in 16 gauge. And it adds both to the weight, but also to the cost of putting this stove together. And Chris does tell me that it can be a bit of a challenge to work with as well, trying to bend it. But as a result, you get a extremely well efficient burn inside of the stove and the durability. Now I've had about a dozen fires, maybe 20 fires in this over the last little while. I have absolutely no warping whatsoever, which is unusual because I've had some pretty intense fires in the stove. But that's not the testimony. The testimony for this stove is Chris's personal version of this, which Chris has had seven hundred fires in it and to be honest it doesn't look any different than mine maybe a little bit more faded on the anodized aluminum but 700 fires zero warping so i guess if nothing else that speaks to the durability of the design before we go outside and do some demonstrations with the Haven, I just wanted to talk for a few minutes about the company Brightfire as well as the design intent for this stove. So Chris Cavers, the owner of Brightfire, was born and raised in the province of New Brunswick, Canada before moving to the United States where he now lives and builds these stoves and in his home. Now Chris also tells me that he was the youngest person ever to become a licensed guide for the province of New Brunswick. Now what that tells me is that Chris has a lifetime of experience that he could draw on in the design of this stove. Now as far as the design intent, Chris had a few things that he was looking to accomplish and I think they're nicely captured in the byline amazing fires and delicious food made with just a handful of wood. Basically Chris was looking to create something first that could be a replacement for a small campfire, something that you could sit around and enjoy without having to collect a whole Whole lot of firewood but also important to Chris was to create something that you could cook over very effectively and we talked a little bit about that a few moments ago and how the uh, components work together so that you can start using the stove the moment the fire is lit and the third thing is efficiency Chris wanted to create something that would use a minimum amount of wood and allow you to get cooking right away and he does that with the design of the stove this being a wood gasifier uses the least amount of fuel and is virtually smoke free at least once it gets going. So Chris has captured all three of those very nicely in the design of the stove. Also inherent in this stove is the design as I explained earlier with the wide stance and the low profile of the stove you're very unlikely to ever knock this over unintentionally. Okay now that we have gone over each of those things let's get outside and do some cooking. All right, time to do some demonstrations of the Bright Fire Haven in my backyard, on my deck, on my testing st stand that I've made for small wood stoves. So what I have set up here is obviously the stand, two fire bricks, not for any special reason, because as you see, on top of the fire bricks, I have placed a piece of computer paper because I want to show you how much heat actually does transfer down. I do have a wooden windscreen built around it because, well, it's kind of windy here today. It's right about zero, and I'm not sure if it's showing up in the camera, but we're having wet snow fall all around us. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, not a big impact to the operation of the stove, but I just wanted to set the working parameters. Now, what we're going to do is get a fire started in this. I have two sausages that I'll be cooking up for my lunch. And as we get the fire started, I'll talk a little bit more about the stove. So what I have done is pre-loaded the stove with my wood. It is all hardwood and it's all in a horizontal configuration. So here's the place to start, I guess, is this stove is intended, like all wood gasifying stoves, is intended to be top lit. In other words, you put a fire on top of your wood. It's called T-LUD, T-L-U-D, which stands for Top Lit Up Draft. So the fire actually kind of burns down through the wood, releasing wood gases as the wood comes up to temperature. Those wood gases mix with the reintroduced oxygen at the jets around the top, and that's where you get your secondary combustion. Optionally, I could have vertically stacked the sticks. The difference being is vertically stacked sticks burn faster. The, the Consumption of the wood is much faster down through the vertical stacks, slower when you do it this way. So if you're looking for a cooking fire and you're not looking for high heat, then this is a better way to go. So what I have to start this off is a piece of wood wool. Good size piece actually, which tends to light up very quickly as you can see. Give that half a second. 
And now I need to build a small fire on top. I'm using wood chips from actually carving my last cooksa. So again, hardwood and all dry, very dry. So I should have no problem getting the fire started with this, but it's gonna take a few minutes just the same. You can see the wind is starting to play havoc a little bit already. But once the fire moves into the wood, the, wood will, or the wind will have much less of an impact because uh, the design of the stove. It is so sheltered from the wind. And I've got wind pretty much straight on right now. So that's one of the nice things about this. You can operate it in some pretty, I don't want to say sketchy conditions, but some pretty heavy weather. Even heavy rain. Now, heavy rain, once you get the fire going, uh, easy enough if the fire is going and starts to rain on you. I'll talk about the accessories and how they can be added in. But you can actually bring it, the, the top, the, the plate here, right down to a point where there's only a small gap of air here, or gap there. And that's enough to keep the fire going and protect it from the flames. It does dampen it down, but it does keep the fire going that way. Oh, here's a nice little bit bigger piece of wood to put on. So as the fire catches on, let's just talk about a few more things. We've talked about two different ways of stacking wood in. Uh, in a future demonstration, I will be using wood pellets because this really is, I don't want to say designed for wood pellets, designed for wood pellets and wood. And of course, being a wood stove, you got to demonstrate it with wood, but I will be demonstrating it with wood pellets. Chris always recommends hardwood pellets that are in des designed for cooking over, like smoking pellets, that type of thing. Quality good pellets, especially if you're going to be cooking or uh, right over the flame. You don't want to introduce any chemicals that may have been used by binders in the, the making of the pellets, which obviously that makes sense. So a couple things I want to show you. I don't know how much I talked about this before. This is the pot rest, and the pot rest can be right at the, the lower level. It can be at the center level. It can be at the top level. With those three removable uh, crossbars, you can remove them in the center. Now, here's what I want to say about this. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do is to see how well I can get this stove to work with a Trangia alcohol stove. Reason being is maybe first thing in the morning or sometime in the afternoon, I don't want to go through the work of building up a full fire. I just want a quick hot water to make my coffee or tea with. Then this is the thing to use right down on top, right at the base level, alcohol stove turn up inside, supported on something to bring it up to inch, inch and a half from the bottom of the pot. And this is your pot stand. Now, originally, before Chris came out with that, I was using this as my pot stand. And this is your grill plate. Uh, didn't work out so well. And the reason being is this was a huge heat sink. As you can well imagine, actually it was designed to grab the heat and kind of dissipate it around anything you're grilling. And that's what I'm going to be using today. And so as a pot stand, it didn't work out so well. Too much of the heat was taken into this metal and didn't get to the bottom of the pot. Okay, let's have a look and see how this is going. Starting to catch down in there. Oh, that's great. The wood wool has not anywhere near consumed itself, and I've already think I'm starting to see the secondary combustion taking place. Now, here's the way to do this. I could probably start cooking right away. In fact, I will in a moment's time when I finish talking here by taking this plate, the grill plate, and putting it at the highest level. So at this level, minimal amount of heat, and especially with this wind, is going to be reaching. Let's see. Not a lot of heat, but it's a great place to start. If I don't find it's hot enough, I'll just take it and move it down to the next level. In fact, I think I may start there. Yeah, I feel some heat coming through there. If I wanted to use this as a fry pan, then I would take this plate put it in in this direction. So now it's a four-sided fry pan. Now, I did do an egg on here. It's a little tricky. You want to make sure it's hot enough that the egg doesn't run out and down the sides. Not that there's a lot of gap here at the corners, but there's a little bit. Same time, you don't want it so hot that the egg sticks like crazy. So obviously a little bit of butter inside helps a lot. One of the things I want to show you about this pan is this notch or groove or uh, opening right here. What that's intended for is for placement. If you want to turn this upside down, and then take it off, what can I use? Maybe I'll use one of the cross stars. If you had a, a fork or, or a set of tongs that were narrow enough, 
or even your knife blade if you want to do that, you can lift this and turn it over. I think it'd be better with a fork myself. And now you can flip it up. So either way you want to use this, that's what that notch is for. Today we're going to be using the grill. And again, I'm still just waiting a little bit till the fire really starts to engage down below. Although I could probably put my sausages on. Why don't I do that? Put the sausages on now. A little bit of a sizzle. I could have waited a few more minutes. Yeah, I may end up, uh, well, you can see how much wind there is. I may end up moving the windscreen around and changing the position of the cameras just to give it a little bit more protection as we go along. Yeah, okay, so far so good. Still waiting on the fire to really get engaged and I'll show you how that works out. So let's just talk about using pots and pans on here because the obvious thing is if you're restricted to using this grill plate, this as a fry pan, and this as a pot stand, well, there's a couple of pieces missing right off the top. You need a place to put a kettle. And that's what this is all about. So this is your pot stand for a kettle or any number of pots. Now you are restricted to the size of the opening, but having said that, you can get some pretty good sized pots on here. I don't know about a large Dutch oven. I will say it will support a large Dutch oven for the testing. I did put my Dutch oven on top of the pot stand. No problem at all. The problem is, of course, is this is intended for something that large. It's not intended to have uh, something hanging way out here, a little kind of cantilever. Again, having said that, if I take this off, take the back plate off, I can get a good size fry pan like a large, maybe even a 10 inch skillet, cast iron skillet down on the base down there and it works just fine. So you're going to have to go through your collection of pots and pans to see which one is the one that you want to use with this, but you, weight consideration, or weight is not a consideration, it'll support all the weight. Size is the consideration here. I think that might be a little bit hot, and as you can see. All right, there's a good indication. Can I move it up? Yes, I can. Not too hot. So I don't have to wait for the flames to die down in order to do this, to cook at a higher height. I just move it, and that's how I adjust my heat. And there's still heat reaching them. Okay, let's have a look inside of the fire. Yeah, it's still really establishing itself. That wood wall, kind of strange stuff. Kind of like created charcoal out of itself. I'm seeing some secondary combustion. I'm not sure if it's showing up. I'll certainly bring you in some a little bit closer so you can see it. Okay, I think what I'll do now is just cut away for a few minutes, work on tending my sausages, and bring you back as they get closer to being cooked and give you some close-ups inside of the stove. I'm hoping you can see in behind the flames to see the secondary combustion taking place along those jets on the back wall. Okay, yeah, I think they're showing up on the monitor. Good. What a nice looking fire. You can see that the wood inside looks more like it's charring than burning, which is gasification taking place. Nice, clean, smokeless fire. There's a lot of heat coming out of that stove right now. It's just nice to sit and watch. I'm busy cooking my sausages. I raised the grill to the top level and I actually added the pan in. Let's see if I can pan up there. Because there was so much heat coming out that uh, I didn't want the sausages to burn. So I can continue to cook them and as that load, that's still the original load of wood, as that wood burns down, then uh, I can lower the pan to meet the heat. So the flames have started to die down from that original load of wood still going. So not quite as intense as it was. Good opportunity to show you how I would lower the pan. So I can lift the pan off, reinsert it, get a little closer to the heat. I think what I'll do is I'm going to take it right down to the surface so you can see that as well because there's one more thing I 
don't know if I mentioned this before or not, so let's take that off, set it aside. The back plate itself is designed to actually act like a chimney stone in a fireplace or a pit that you might work on outdoors. So that as the heat and the smoke rises out of the stove, it actually draws itself up that back plate and kind of curls around, trapping it on the bottom of the... Uh, the grill or the plant pan or whatever else you're using. Now, if I want to go right down to the lowest position, lift that right out. I can feel the heat in my gloves, but it's not that hot. Then I can just lock this in to the right place. And now all the heat that's rising in the stove is captured. I'm not losing any of it out of the sides. It's applying itself directly to the bottom of my pan. And as you can see, my sausages are, well, they're probably cooked. And I can let them go a few minutes. Look how plump they are. Don't poke your sausages. <laughs> let the fat stay inside. That's how you get a nice juicy sausage. Don't let the, the fat roll out onto your pan. All right, a few more minutes time. I'll take these off. I'll enjoy my lunch. And uh, once the stove is all cooled down, we'll do a wrap up for this video. Right, quickly, just before we wrap this video up, I thought I'd show this. This is that piece of computer paper that I put underneath the stove to show you just how little heat transfers down. The only staining is uh, grease from the sausages that I was cooking. That's very impressive. Just shows the safety that's built into the stove. They can put this virtually on top of any surface without concern for too much heat transferring down. All right, now we can wrap the video up. All right, let's see if we can wrap this video up with a few comments for the Bright Fire Haven. So, you know, I really like that Chris was able to meet his design intent with this stove. This is a fire pit that you can sit back and enjoy and at the same time cook a full meal over using just a small amount of wood. It really is a fun stove to use from that point of view. At the same time, it does have a few downsides. One is obviously the weight. But again, we've already declared that this is not a backpacking stove. So as long as you have a means of transporting it, then that's not really an issue. The other thing is it does take a bit of time to learn how to put the stove together and take it apart for storage afterwards. Again, once you've got that covered, that's not an issue either. You know, there is so much more that I would have liked to show you today, but there's only so much time in a video that I can do that. So what I'll be doing is coming back at a later point and giving you more demonstrations with the stove, either here in my backyard or when I get out to do some car camping. So what I'll do is put all the information I have given you in the video description below as well as the contacts for this stove if you want to consider its purchase. If you have any comments or questions please put those in the comments section below but until next time get out and explore and take that path less travel because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.